This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. still looking for Lucan all over the world and we must endeavour to find him alive or dead. I screamed, please don't kill me, John. I opened the door and I said, help me, help me, help me. I've just escaped from being murdered. On the 7th of November, 1974, a young woman called Sandra Rivett, who was nanny to Lady Lucan's children, was brutally bludgeoned to death in the family's house in London's Belgravia. Lady Lucan was also attacked. She suffered serious head wounds, but survived. A later inquest found that the attacker was her husband, Lord Lucan. This is before I knew him. He looks well honed, not an ounce of spare flesh on him. Quite godlike in some poses. Well, he was a fine figure of a man. I mean, I didn't consciously compare him to any of my other lovers. <laughs> um, did he compare well? I, he would have compared very, very well. Excellent. I was staying with my sister and brother-in-law in their country house, and I noticed my future husband, then Lord Bingham, and I thought he looked rather apart and different. Obviously, my sister told me a little about him. She said he's got socialist parents, and he's a professional gambler, and he's said to be queer. Um, quite untrue, but he talked to me and seemed interested. Then he asks me out the following Tuesday and several dinners and things like that. We obviously got to know each other a little bit better. And then one lunch, he said, can I drive you back home? And I said, yes, I'd be delighted. I could see that he was getting impatient because the traffic was, and he was driving quite fast and sweat appeared on his forehead. And I was feeling the tension that he was feeling coming up in me. And we got out and went into his flat. He picked up the telephone and said, tell the boys I won't be coming tonight. See you in the morning, bye. Put it down, pick me up off the sofa and carry me into the bedroom. Full stop. Inaugurated just three years ago, the International Daily Express offshore powerboat race is already a classic. He confided in me about how he hoped to win the Daily Express powerboat race the following summer. This is White Migrant, a quarter of power in a pint of boat. White Migrant and Migrant, his boats. He spent all his money buying a boat. It's almost unbelievable that anyone would spend all their capital buying a boat, isn't it? He actually hired someone to film him because he expected to win. 
Three quarters of the way around the island, and the Bembridge Ledge boy comes up with white migrants still leading. Lord Bingham and crew Bruce Campbell giving quarter to no man. Well, it was unfortunate that it's such an expensive sport, especially if you haven't got a job. Now we learn the sensational news. White migrant has sunk. She sprang a leak. Her pump seized. She capsized and sank. Her crew are safe. They bailed out. They didn't go down with the boat. It was very unlucky. History Hit is a streaming platform that exclusively releases quality historical documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has thousands of hours of content with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans can get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. I was getting on. I was 26. And in those days, you were approaching being on the shelf. He was 29. We were both really at an age when we should get married. He said, will you marry me? And I didn't say anything. And then he said, will you marry me? And I said, yes, I will marry you. To marry a peer of the realm was a coup on your part. That's our wedding. It was sparsely attended on both sides because neither of us were very popular. We had one social guest, which was poor Princess Alice, because she, my mother-in-law had been a lady-in-waiting, and so she invited her. In fact, I heard one woman say, there's nobody here. <laughs> so I, I lived, she was quite, quite right. There wasn't anybody of any social interest there at all. Years and years later, he said to me, you married me when you were old and grateful. One of the couple's wedding presents came from the groom's friend, John Aspinall, who gave them 200 pounds to spend in his private member's casino, the Claremont Club. It's been described as the most beautiful terrace house in London. The membership's quite high, it's 60 guineas a year. So, it's exclusive from the point of view that not too many people are keen to pay 60 guineas a year to be a member of a club. So he went to the Claremont Club. He played in the Minnows game. I sat behind him and I began to notice that he was becoming slightly distraught. He kept calling for the changeur and writing his name like this. Finally, he stood up and I followed him and he said to John Burke, one of the directors, he wanted to join the big game. John Burke said, no, John, go home. Go home. And in the car, he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I said, how much did you lose? And he said, 8,000. <laughs> so I said, oh, dear. And then he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry again. And we went to bed and he tossed and turned and I tried to comfort him and sort of rubbed his back and said, don't worry, you'll win it back again. So we obviously spent a very unhappy Christmas, as you can imagine, having lost. Well, that was all his money. He, did, he had only had 9,000 pounds because his boat had sunk. It had been insured for 9,000 and... Uh, well, I suppose he had £1,000 left. <laughs> then, six weeks later, his father dies. He inherited money and land. Golf course at Leyland, Middlesex, that sort of thing. 
And so we had a substantial injection of money, you could describe it. And we were looking to buy a house because I was by this time pregnant. And finally, we found one we liked, 46 Lower Belgrave Street, for 17 and a half thousand with the curtains and carpets. It was a bargain. We moved in, and finally, I gave birth to a daughter, with which we were thrilled. After we'd had Francis, we got a letter from John Aspinall, and he said to my husband, has marriage quietened you down? Why don't you come and have a drink with us one evening? I found that, in the end, if you gamble for high stakes, you more or less have to gamble with your friends because it's a very unwise man who gambles with a stranger for high stakes. Did your husband look up to John Aspinall? I can only think of a sort of rude word for it, but I thought he, I can't say it, um, he sort of oiled up to him. Really, in slightly nauseating way. Aspinall was making a fortune from friends and fellow gamblers at the Claremont Club. It helped pay for an unusual lifestyle, including his own private zoo. My husband had a weak father, and I think he lacked father figures. He was extremely useful to John Aspinall because he looked so very obviously aristocratic. So he would encourage high rollers of different nationalities to sit and play with him. So he went and had a drink with him, and they discussed business. It was that they would start a baccarat game, and he would be the dealer and would have a percentage of the bank's winnings or takings. Well, it was rather a, I would say, undignified thing for a peer of the realm to do. He used to get insulted quite often. They'd throw their chips at him. But he ignored it, was indifferent to it. Anyway, the Baccarat Bank lost money. But the habit was by then established that we would go there every day. That's how it all began. The expectations of me were to produce children, and I knew the pressure was on now for a son. That was really worrying. Worrying? Well, it's worrying, because if you don't produce a son, your reputation is in tatters. Really? Yes, it's as bad as that. And I was absolutely thrilled, obviously, that I had produced a son and heir. And that's George in his pram. Do you think you were a good mother? I could have been better. In what ways? Perhaps I did stay in bed rather too often. <laughs> Nanny got very indignant because sometimes I would hire a temporary nanny to come on her day off. And she said, not even on my day off do you look after those children. Well, it was only a few times. But she, you know, was wanting to criticise me the whole time. But I also took them out, and they used to call it the glorious day because they had a good time on my day. I wasn't so strict. My great pleasure was in teaching them to read and write and add up. Although it, did, it only took perhaps five minutes a day doing it, I felt that was my one piece of useful thing that I did. But uh, that was my interaction with them. And usually in the summer, they went to Westgate on Sea with Nanny, uh, while my husband and I went to Monte Carlo or Monaco and uh, played backgammon. Did you miss them? Um, no, because they knew they were perfectly safe with Annie, really. 
I have to say, to an outsider, from what you're, you've described in the last five minutes, it feels a slightly cold relationship. Is that a wrong impression? A cold relationship? All my relationships are cold. Good Lord. It's a double exposure. I think there's two images. Do you see what I mean? Can yes, you one is of the voyage of the Crown Burr and the other is the photograph of my bottom. I think it's an excellent bottom. And so did your husband? He obviously did, yes. My husband liked to use his movie camera. Well, I think you could say he was a bottom man. In the early years of their marriage, the Lucans used to film each other to record their glamorous jet-set life. That is Sir James Goldsmith. He was a dedicated businessman, I would say, celebrated. To sit next to him at lunch, you know, he was easy to talk to. I didn't appreciate any of the wonderful things I saw, partly because I had no one to share them with. He wasn't communicative, so you couldn't really enjoy it as a couple. You were both on your own, in a strange sort of way. He talked to me more before our marriage than he ever did afterwards. He said that's the point of being married, you don't have to talk to the person. He was on his own and I was on my own, wherever we went. He always had to appear richer than he actually was, which is a terrible strain. Having to go to St Moritz because it's good for your image to go there. I mean, is this a good way to live? Not really. This was a boat we hired to go along the Riviera, the Italian and French Riviera. Now, let's see who it is. That's Greville Howard. He's on the left, far left, with a stripy shirt. Four years into the Lucan's marriage, cracks began to appear. I saw him every night at the Claremont Club. When we had dinner, he'd have dinner with us, sometimes with his sister. And I got closer and closer and looked forward to seeing him every day. That sort of thing, gradually, it was building up into something. We spoke on the telephone, various other things. Would you say you'd fallen in love with him? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, he was more of a human being than my husband was. He's a more sensitive person than my husband. Is that partly what attracted you? Partly, probably. Anyway, my husband begins to realise when he warns him off, he gets scared, and then suddenly he turns cold. And I'm absolutely bewildered. I think, what on earth's happened? So you just felt he was suddenly rejecting you? Yes, I'm bewildered, to use the word. How far had it gone? Not to the fatal end. I hadn't been unfaithful. Well, I just took it too hard. I should have been more resilient. And I became very depressed. 
because of this rejection. And so uh, I took to my bed. Now my husband, I don't know what he thought, but he took me for a drive. And he took me to the Priory nursing home. And I told, I did tell the doctor what I thought had happened. And he said, I think you'd better come in. And I, <laughs> I ran, I opened the door, down the stairs, ran and they chased after me. Because I didn't want to go into any, that kind of hospital. Anyway, they gave me a horrible antipsychotic drug to have at home. It was to be the beginning of a long battle with her husband over accusations of mental instability. The accusations, did they start early from him to you? It's very difficult to tell when they started, but they just escalated. It just went on and on building. And I was unfortunate that I had lost my female GP and I had all these male GPs. And they believed every word he said and even suggested that I was psychotic and things like that, which is so utterly absurd. Once they start you on this step, well, it's very hard to get off the mental health regime. He didn't think he had to be nice to me anymore. I was there, but I wasn't there to be nice to. He said, I'm going to beat these mad ideas out of your head, instructed me to bend over with my hands on the seat of the chair, and he would give me 10 strokes with the cane. But he could have hit harder. They were measured blows. And then afterwards, he'd be very affectionate and look regretfully at the damage he had caused. It was only repeated twice more throughout the period. Do you think he was, he was doing it because he got sadomasochistic pleasure out of it? Well, he must have got pleasure out of it because he had intercourse afterwards. So I would say he did get pleasure out of it. But he obviously had thought about doing it because when I opened my dress cupboard, the, the stick was hanging there and the end had been cut off and wrapped in plaster so that it wouldn't cut so much. So he had been thinking about doing it. And the bludgeon was covered in plaster, bandage, exactly the same as the stick hanging up in the, cudder, in the cupboard. I just think that's very strange. The lead piping used to bludgeon Lady Lucan and Sandra Rivet was also wrapped in sticking plaster. Have you just made that connection just now? Yes, well, because I've just mentioned to you what he did. That's the connection. He wanted to do it. And then, well, I mean, I'd, why did he wrap plaster round the bludgeon? Why? What do you think? I just... I just don't know. Well, it's a sustained campaign of undermining me in every way he could. He'd just undermine me, ignore me. And it continued until one day he called a doctor and he said, is she fit to be left with the children, that is? I looked at him pleadingly and he said, yes, she is fit. He rushed upstairs, packed two canvas bags and dashed out of the house. He was never to return. I thought that he would eventually, but he was never to return. And the doctor said to me, he thought I should know that my husband and another doctor and a social worker had come with the intention of having me sectioned under the Mental Health Act. After Lord Lucan moved out of the house, Lady Lucan decided to accuse him of desertion. She spoke to a solicitor who wrote to Lord Lucan asking what he planned to pay to support the family. Rather childishly, he thought, she's gone to her solicitor, I'll go to mine and turn it into a sort of war. He came to the house and he was grinning. 
and I thought to myself, he's got something up his sleeve. And he had already instructed his solicitors to take custody of the children. Shortly afterwards, the doorbell rang, and there was my state registered nurse standing there. And I said, where are the children? And she said, keep calm, and proceeded to tell me she was being followed by two men. And she quickly realized that they were something to do with my husband, because he also appeared. The children gaily jumped into his car, and he drove off for the children. Well, I mean, we were absolutely horrified by it. And I was horrified and called the police and everything else, and they all said, very sorry, we can't do anything because this is a court order. Lord Lucan had obtained temporary custody of Francis, George and Camilla. He claimed his wife was mentally unstable. Lady Lucan decided to fight the custody order and went to court to prove that she was a competent mother. When I got in the court for the custody case, I mean, I was there for 11 days, so they could gaze at me for 11 days. Well, I obviously wasn't unstable, or certainly no more unstable than a lot of other people. <laughs> As part of his case against his wife, Lord Lucan used to provoke her into emotional outbursts. She was unaware that he was secretly recording them. I'd insult him. Every possible insult. What sort of thing? It's things? rather personal. I say things like, you're miserable, weak, drooping little penis. I mean, it's pretty strong stuff. Along those lines. It was played in court. It was pretty terrible. But he was foolish because it made him look worse than me. So you got custody of the children? Yes. And he was granted every other weekend and half the holidays to see the children. Did he have a different relationship with the children after your split than before? I thought he had a growing relationship. It was beginning where it hadn't begun before because there was always Nanny and Westgate on sea and he was gambling. And I think he was beginning to understand about how to be a father. I think he did it very well. Did you feel victorious when you won custody? No, because it was a Pyrrhic victory. But I had to have a nanny. That was part of the ruling, the custody with a mother with a nanny. My husband didn't realize how much legal firms charge absolutely no idea. So suddenly he was having this massive drain on his finances. And he started playing games that really our no professional gambler would play. Well, because the odds are so much against you, but he threw absolutely wildly. So they stopped his credit and, you know, he was just tumbling down. Nannies are hard to come by and well, they don't want a job with children aged three, seven, and ten. I mean, they're beyond nanny age, really. He was allowed to have them without a nanny, which I also thought was dreadfully unfair, but still. But eventually you got a good nanny. The last nanny, Mrs. Rivet, by the way, Frances liked her, so that was a really good bonus. She was good, kind, decent girl, woman, really. And Sandra understood the situation. I had her for nine weeks before it happened. On the night in question, we went upstairs and the evening's television viewing began. And at some stage, Francis joined me on my bed. At about five to nine, Sandra put her head round the door and said, would you like a cup of tea? Well, the news came on at nine o'clock, following Mastermind. And I said to Francis, 
I wonder why Sandra is taking so long. And she said, I'll go and see. And I said, no, no, I'll go. And I made my way downstairs to the ground floor. The, the kitchen was in the basement and I looked down the stairs and I saw that it was dark. And I thought, that's strange. She can't be there. Well, because it's dark. She couldn't be making tea in the dark. Then I heard a movement or noise of something or someone coming from the downstairs cloakroom. And someone rushed out and hit me on the head four times. I screamed and my husband put three gloved fingers down my throat to stop me screaming. And we started to fight. And he tried to push me down the basement stairs, but I clung onto the balustrade and kicked one of them out of place. And he started to strangle me and then tried to poke my eye out. But I con continued fighting and then I grasped at his genitals and he moved back and I found myself sitting in between his legs. And I put my hand down and I felt something metal covered in bandaging and a great deal of my hair. So I just sat there and I said to him, please don't kill me, John. And then um, I asked, Where, where's Sandra? And um, he said, She's dead. Don't look. Well, I think when your life is, is in danger, you'll, you'll try and do your best. And with your antagonist, you will try and play on his psychology, which you think that he might respond to. But I still tried to placate him. I said, what shall we do with the body? Sandra has few friends. No one will miss her. And I can stay in the house till my wounds have healed. He appeared to be accepting of this suggestion. Then he said, have you got any sleeping tablets? And I said, yes, I have. And he hustled me, not helped me, he hustled me up the stairs. And I went up the stairs, but I was concentrating with all my might on how to survive the situation that I found myself in. We opened my bedroom door and Francis was still there watching television. He said to her, go to bed. And she left and went to bed. We decided to go into the ensuite bathroom and we stood there in front of the mirror and I could see that my face was absolutely covered in blood and it was impossible to see how much damage had been done because there was so much blood. So I, I said I wanted to lie down and we went back into the, to the bedroom and he put a towel on the pillow and I got on it and lay down. He said, would you take them? I said, yes. Well, presumably, he was hoping that I would go to sleep and he would be able to, well, I, I don't know this is true, that he would put a pillow over my head and smother me. He then went back into the bathroom and I heard the taps running and I realized he wouldn't be able to hear properly. I jumped to my feet, opened the door, and I ran as fast as I could down the stairs and out of the front door, turning left down the street and not calling anything as I had been. I saved it all for the run to the Pummer's Arms, which I knew would be open at the end of the street. I opened the door and I said, Help me, help me, help me. I've just escaped from being murdered. 
He's in the house. And they were in varying stages of inebriation. And they just gaped at me. And so I said, he's murdered my nanny. And that was that. The, it was all I said. They laid me on a bench. And that was all. The, somebody sent for the police. But I learnt afterwards that my husband, when he came back from the bathroom, went up the stairs and called, where are you, Veronica? He still thought I would be going to help him. And I could imagine the horror when he realised I had gone. On the 8th of November, 1974, the world woke up to headlines about the missing Earl and the murdered nanny. At first, you don't feel the pain from the blows, and then slowly, the pain starts to come. My throat, oh, was so sore from where he'd thrust three gloved fingers down it. He could be in this country. I, he, he can be anywhere, I just don't know. Do you think he's altered his appearance at all? Again, I don't know. Have you sighted him at all anywhere? Have there been any reliable reports? <clears throat> no. I was taken to St George's Hospital. I was taken into an operating theatre and my wounds were sutured. Now, I think he must have gone through an extremely traumatic experience that evening. Um, I wish he hadn't disappeared. If he was listening to you now, what would you say to him? I'd say, get hold of me as soon as possible. I wish to interview him as soon as possible. And if uh, any person is helping him or assisting him or have any knowledge of his whereabouts, we'd like them to let us know. Straight after the attack, Lord Lucan had left the house and driven to Uckfield in East Sussex to see his friend Susan Maxwell Scott. She was the last person to see him alive. He was obviously suffering from a certain amount of shock, but he was perfectly in control of himself. He had told her that he'd interrupted an intruder who was attacking his wife, and that she, in a state of shock, had wrongly thought he was the attacker. After that, he had panicked and fled. And you believed what he told you? I do believe what he told me entirely. I'm quite certain that he told me the complete truth. Um, I would think that the probability is that he is alive, but I have no knowledge, no foundation for that. It's just a feeling I think he's alive. His closest friends are, stand absolutely firm behind him. They find it inconceivable, with the knowledge of him as a person, that he could possibly have had been involved in a crime of this nature. And we would all, I think, like to see him back as soon as possible so that the whole matter can be cleared up. While Lady Lucan was recovering in hospital, she discovered that a family court would decide upon the temporary custody of her children, who were already wards of court. Needless to say, this horrified me. I leapt to my feet, asked the police, and they drove me to the court. And the judge adjourned the hearing, and he didn't hear till I was well enough to defend. At the end of the hearing, the judge, Mr. Justice Rees, issued a statement in which he said an order had been made which meant that the children would live with their mother. I was re-granted custody. Children, strangely, take things very much for granted, provided it doesn't really impinge on their security. I mean, they were still fed, they still went to the same schools, everything went along the same way. And they never asked about him? No. I think one day Camilla said, I don't think Daddy's coming back. And I think I just said, no, I don't think he's coming back. But nothing more than that. She was the most articulate of the three. And that was all she said. She obviously did miss him. For her to say, I don't think Daddy's coming back. I just said, I don't think so. Poor child. After seeing Susan Maxwell Scott, 
Lord Lucan drove off in the car he'd borrowed from a friend a few days earlier. It was found abandoned in the port town of New Haven. What do you think happened to him? I think he wrote written his last letter to his great friend, Michael Stoop. It was a suicide letter. Tell them that you knew me and that all I cared about was them. He doesn't expect ever to see them again. His children? Yes. Got out of a car, found the nearest pillar box and put the letter, unstamped letter, in it. He must have posted the letter because it arrived. And then, nobody knows, but I would say he got on the ferry. How he got on the ferry, I don't know. But he would have jumped off in the middle of the channel, in the way of the propellers, so that his remains wouldn't be found. I think quite brave. Everybody who knew him thinks that he committed suicide. Well, they've said other than that. Those that knew him? Yes. Who? I think didn't Aspinall and others say... I'm sure he's out there somewhere and that he didn't commit suicide. Oh, no, no, no. I I don't think... If they did, it's just a joke. Well, OK, what I want to also just ask you something about, Veronica, is that in 1981, I've seen it, you did a news interview in which you said you were convinced, convinced that he was alive. Why did you say that? Can you give me the date? Yes, 1981. That was just, I was very heavily drugged at that time. Are you going to start proceedings to get your husband declared legally dead? I don't really believe that he is dead. And therefore, to start those proceedings would be against my beliefs. It's a terrible thing to be drugged because you really are not in control. The drug is. But why did you say that, that you were convinced he was alive? Well, it's rather difficult um, to think. I suddenly sprung on you. You can't think why, but I do remember in 1981, I was in poor shape. And why do you think your husband tried to kill you? He thought there was only one way out, to have the children to himself and no longer have me to support. Well, he worked it out. This was the way that he was going to solve his financial problems. Well, it does seem a bit extreme to most people. He was just completely overwrought with the problems that he had facing him. From every angle, people were asking for money, and there just wasn't any money there. He was just... He went mad with the pressure. My youngest child I had the best relationship with. She always had an interesting comment to make wherever I went with her. She always had something to say, which made her great company. George, I always felt he wasn't as fond of me as a lot of sons are of their mother. And Francis, the eldest one, well, I think our relationship had been damaged by Nanny Jenkins because she would try and use Francis against me. That's the problem with having a nanny. Oh, there's rivalry. (laughs) One is a substitute mother. After the murder, Lady Lucan had become heavily addicted to antidepressants. Finally, in 1982, the official solicitor intervened on behalf of the children. They were fostered by her sister and brother-in-law, the Shand kids. I knew that all was lost, and it's as well to accept all is lost and not keep banging your head against a brick wall, because it'll only upset you and... You've got to think of yourself. And um, they would have, many ways, a better life than living with me. I once bumped into George um, in a park, but we didn't say very much. 
um, I suppose 1982. Is when you last spoke to him? Yes. I wanted to have a family. It was my family. And sadly, what has happened is I've lost my family. It's just been lost. But it's not my fault that I lost them. I think that must have been my ambition, really, to have a family. A family that I'd ha be happy with and they'd be happy with me. But it didn't turn out like that. It'll always be a mystery to me why it didn't. Do you have any regrets? Regrets? Well, I'm deeply sad that my marriage caused Mrs. Sandra Rivet to die. I'm very sorry about that, but I can't alter it except not to forget about her, and I don't forget about her. <laughs>